Welcome to First Baptist Church Murphy. Glad to see you here this morning. Glad to make you made it out on this rainy day. Let's take the opportunity to meet and greet somebody around you. Let them know that you're glad to see them here this morning. So uh, this is the time in the service where we focus on some scripture memory. Now, I was sharing with the students this morning, uh, if you were in life group, we covered the text 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 16, and talked about training in godliness. And so one of the things I shared with them was a lot of the elements that we have in our worship service from fellowship to scripture memory, to prayer, to worship, to preaching are all different elements to help train you in godliness. And now, if you just get trained once a week um, in the athletic arena, you're not going to be very good, all right? Um, and you're going to be sore all the time. If you just lifted weights once a week, it'd be a painful experience. Uh, and so that's where training daily and consistently uh, in godliness is important. And so uh, we have a new scripture memory verse this week uh, and for the next uh, several weeks, Ephesians 3, 20 through 21. So I'll read it out loud, then we'll read it together, and then we'll work on trying to share that with one another. Ephesians 3, 20 through 21. Now to him who is able... To do more, far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Ephesians 3, 20 through 21. Now let's read that together. Ephesians 3, 20 through 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Ephesians 3, 20 through 21. Now turn and share that with somebody. <sighs> is a time where we focus on uh, prayer. 
Uh, and in fact, I asked the students this morning, what's the uh, axe acrostic we used? And they were able to uh, uh, spell that out. And so we focus on A, adoring God, C is confess to God, T is thank God, and S is share with God. And so this is the time for you just to pause and quietly where you are, uh, spend some time in prayer. And maybe for you this morning, you want to adore God. Maybe there's something you need to confess to God. Maybe you have a lot of blessings, you just want to thank God for something. Or maybe you have a particular need, or maybe you know somebody who has a particular need, and you just want to pray for that during this moment. So let's pause, quietly pray where you, where you are. God, we come to you this morning uh, thanking you for uh, the rain that you've uh, provided uh, today. and Lord, how you continually refresh the land. Lord, how you refresh us uh, through your word. Lord, we thank you for the blessings, the many different blessings that you have provided for us. Lord, uh, you're able to do more than we can even ask or think. We rejoice in that and we celebrate that. Lord, we pray that you would fill us with your spirit in this moment. And Lord, that you'd enable us to worship you in spirit and truth. Lord, that you'd enable us to hear from you and to respond in obedience to your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Remain standing as we continue to worship. Psalm 147 this morning. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise him. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. The Lord sustains the humble but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with grateful praise. Make music to God on the harp. Let's sing to him and use our voices as praises. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me
hope is built on nothing less in Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but holy trust in Jesus. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong, in Savior's love, to the storm, He is Lord, Lord of
to you this morning, Father, as we pray for Pastor Ben as he delivers his word, your word, Father, this morning, that we to open our hearts and our ears to your message. We love you and we thank you, and it's in your name we pray. of you here this morning. Uh, if you're watching that, the, the first part of Joel, really up to uh, 2.17, really is focusing on that uh, judgment element. And then you see, we're going to see a transition in our text today, 18 and following, where God's abundant blessings and restoration, uh, his deliverance comes upon the people of God. If you have your copy of Scripture, turn with me to Joel chapter 2. Uh, we're going to begin in verse 18, but just a little review. Uh, last week we looked at verses 12 through 17. And we talked about how important it is to return to the Lord with your whole heart. And then that we need to focus on the character of God. A God who is gracious and loving and compassionate and merciful and then that we need to seek the lord together through prayer and fasting we saw there was another one of those so shofar blowing of the trumpet this time though it was not a warning but it was a call to worship a call to pray a call to fast well apparently the people of israel did return to the lord with their whole heart uh, they did pray, they did fast, they did seek him, and God heard and responded. 
in a very favorable way. And so we're going to see from verse 18 and following how God displays his grace and mercy and how he brings abundant blessing upon the people of God. So follow along with me as I read verses 18 through 27. Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied. And I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. I will remove the northerner far from you and drive him into a parched and desolate land, his vanguard into the, northern, into the eastern sea and his rear guard into the western sea. The stench and foul smell of him will rise for he has done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice. For the Lord has done great things. Fear not, you beast of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green, the tree bears its fruit, the fig tree and the vine give their full yield. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the latter rain as before. The threshing floors shall be full of grain. The vat shall overflow with wine and oil. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and there is none else. And my people shall never again be put to shame. Let's pray. God, we come before you this morning, humble, with a desire to turn from our sin, and to turn to you, and to seek you, the God of grace and mercy, long-suffering. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes so that we see wonderful things in your word this morning. And Lord, that you might help us to see and to understand that you do great things. You've done great things in the past. Lord, you're doing great things now. And you're going to continue to do great things into the future. Lord, we thank you for your presence here. And ask that you would be glorified and honored in our time here together this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. So there's a story about uh, a train that was traveling across country. Two big engines pulling uh, a bunch of passengers. I don't know if you've ever ridden a uh, passenger train across country. I can't say that I have other than uh, hitching a ride on a train probably illegally. Um, and I have rode the dart from uh, here uh, downtown uh, to Dallas. But as far as riding a passenger train across country, I haven't done that. And so the story is told about uh, this train traveling across the country and they're in a pretty desolate kind of uh, area and one of the engines fails. But that's okay. They've got two engines, and the engineer decides to keep on trucking along. And eventually, that engine, too, dies in this desolate place. They're a long way from any, uh, any civilized uh, place for people to come get them, and it's going to be a while before they can get uh, some replacement engines and so the engineer uh, gets on the loudspeaker and communicates with the people on the train. And he says, I've got some bad news for you. The bad news is that both of our engines have failed and we'll be stuck here for some time until the additional engines arrive. The good news is you didn't take this trip on a plane. 
good news. Um, you know, it, I, I can't imagine being in a plane, and I've seen some uh, videos of engines failing. Of course, you see a lot of movies when that happens, and when both of them happen, it's not a good scene. Well, in Joel chapter 1, verse 1, all the way through 2.17, uh, we've seen a lot of bad news, uh, a lot of destruction of property, uh, just a lot of difficulty for God's people. The good news that we did see, even in that midst, was that God is a loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering God. And He forgives us when we repent and turn from our sin and turn back to Him. And we've seen some glimmers of hope along the way, but now... Uh, in verse 18 through the rest of the book of Joel, there's going to be a lot of encouragement, a lot of hope. And the first thing I want you to see as we look in our text, we need to trust in a faithful God. Trust in a faithful God. Look in verse 18. Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. God is always jealous for his land and for his people. In fact, if you were to go back into Exodus chapter 20, Exodus chapter 20 is when uh, God gives Moses uh, the Ten Commandments. Uh, we also see Moses retell that story in Deuteronomy chapter 5. But in Ac Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 through 6, Scripture says, You shall have no other gods before me, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. And so from the very beginning of the Israelite people coming together and being his people, one of the things that we see is that God is a jealous God. There should no be, shouldn't be anything competing for his allegiance and his attention. One of the things the Bible Knowledge Commentary says of this, he is zealous that devotion be given exclusively to him. His uniqueness requires unique devotion. Absence of such dedication is sin and has its effect on future generations. The Lord's jealousy is passionate, is his passionate loyalty toward what is his. A loyalty that prompts him to lash out against anything that would destroy it. Not only is God jealous for his land and people, but he also has pity. Some of your translations may use the word mercy or compassion. And so he has mercy, compassion, pity on his people, and he spares them. He spares them from his wrath and his judgment. And so we see God is faithful in showing his steadfast love to those who keep his commandments. And we've seen the Israelites, there was this call to prayer, this call to fast, this call to lament, and they do. And God is faithful to preserve his people. God has demonstrated his jealousy and compassion on his people and have led him to be faithful throughout generations. You can see story after story. If you're reading through the Old Testament, you've seen this. Uh, think of Noah and Joseph and Moses and Joshua and David and Jonah, and you could go on and on and add a whole lot of other characters in there. And you can see God's faithfulness to his people. God just demonstrated his love to his people ultimately, how? By sending his son to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, to atone for our sins so that it would appease the wrath of a holy, holy God. 
And Jesus rose again on the third day, uh, declaring that he truly is God. We need to trust in a faithful God. And so if you're a believer here, if you've sinned recently, guess what? We all have. Uh, God is demonstrating his faithfulness, his mercy, his pity toward all of us. That, that we're here today. Uh, that we are alive standing in his presence. Trust in God's faithfulness. When you sin, confess your sin, turn from it, and turn to God. And trust his faithfulness. If you haven't taken that step to trust in Christ, if you're not a follower of Christ, then God has demonstrated his mercy and grace to you that you're still here to hear his word and respond in faith to turn from your sin and to trust in Jesus for your salvation. Don't test his love and mercy and grace. Trust in a faithful God. The other thing I want you to see is that we need to believe in a God who restores. Believe in a God who restores. Look in verses 19 through 20. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold! Now when you see that, behold, it's kind of a, an intent, attention getter. Hey, pay attention. I am sending to you grain and wine and oil and you will be satisfied. The items mentioned here in these first few verses hearken back to what he took away, what God ultimately destroyed in the beginning of the book of Joel to get the people's attention. He restores their provisions. He says, Behold, I am sending you grain and wine and oil and you will be satisfied. God provides for your every need. All your basic needs. His provision ultimately leads to satisfaction. It's kind of like, man, you know when you've eaten a, a good meal and you just kind of push away from the table and you go, oh, man. You know those kind of moments? Maybe when you've had a lobster or steak or sometimes chicken noodle soup. Or uh, it's getting cold, so uh, later this week maybe it's chilly or something like that. God restores his provisions. He restores these agricultural provisions. He restores their families. He restores their ability to worship him. Because when they had those things taken away, it really disrupted their worship of God. One of the other things you see is you see God restoring peace. And he says in verse 19, And I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. I will remove the northerner from, far from you, and I will drive him into a parched and desolate land, his vanguard into the eastern sea, and his rear guard into the western sea. The stench and foul smell of him will rise for he has done great things. One of the things we see here, the Israelites, they were always in constant danger of being invaded from uh, a, a bigger foreign country. And God says, no more. The army that I was going to send, I'm not going to send. Uh, I'm displaying my grace and love and mercy towards you. I want you to see that I am a God who restores and I'm going to take care of you. And I'm going to protect you. And I'm going to provide for you. People would no longer look upon the Israelite nation with reproach and say, Oh my goodness. They say they worship the one true God. Look at everything he's taken away from them. No longer. Because they would see the God of the Israelites as the God who restores. And he's also a God who has done great things things. The God who restores continually does great things. It's not just a great thing in the past. It's not just a great thing in the present, but he continues to do great 
things. And ultimately, he does that not just for our benefit, but ultimately he does that for his glory. And so that's something we've got to keep in mind because otherwise we kind of get that uh, big head and we get too proud. Look at all the things that God has done for me and the focus is on me. When God does great things, he does those great things. We're beneficiaries of those, but it's all glory and honor directed toward him. Perhaps one of the greatest examples of things that were taken away but God restored, as you think of everything that happened to Job. Job lost his family. Job was a rich man. God allowed Satan to take all that away. Uh, God took away his health. Uh, the only thing he didn't take away was his life. And in that, God, we see Job was faithful. His friend said, you just need to curse God and die. He wouldn't do that. And we see that ultimately, because Job trusted in a God who restored, God restored Job's family, gave him more children. God restored his, his crops and his cattle and his sheep, gave him even more in abundance. God continually does that. It's amazing to me that when we see, and, and you've seen some of this out in our culture when uh, people take old things and restore them. I'm just amazed that, that people can do some things like that because I struggle to do that. You think of uh, uh, Chip and Joanna Gaines, you know how they would go into a house and, I mean, just kind of totally restore, and they did a lot of tearing out before they finally restored it, but amazing. Uh, one of the things you're going to see uh, this coming Saturday at Fall Fest uh, you're going to see an old orange truck parked out here. Uh, and I've, I, when I first got here, uh, Buddy Russell took me uh, in a drive around Murphy, uh, showing me some different places and telling me different stories. And he took me for a ride in that old truck. Uh, and he told me the story about how he, I mean, he restored and built that thing from the ground up. And so, and it still works, you know. That, you know, if I were to do something like that, I don't know if it would still work. What's even more amazing is how God restores the lives of his people. To think of some of the stuff we've been through, and God is faithful to restore us. I would encourage you to reflect on restoration in your life. What's been destroyed by sin in your life or your family? God wants to bring restoration in that. Perhaps you've had some things destroyed and God has already brought some restoration in some, a variety of ways. Rejoice in that. Share that story so that God gets the glory and it gives other people hope that he can restore them too. What has been destroyed in your life by the sin of others? You see, that's one of the things when we think about sin, we think, oh, it's just going to affect me. It never affects just you. It affects a whole lot of people. And so think about maybe something that has been destroyed in your life by the sin of others that God wants to restore. Or perhaps he has restored. And you can rejoice and celebrate in that. Share that story. What has been destroyed by sin in this church, in this body? Perhaps there have been things in the past that have destroyed some fellowship and unity, and God worked in some powerful ways to turn the tide, to resolve conflict, to bring people, to keep the doors open. Every church has stories in their past about the good and the bad and the ugly. It's just part of living in a sinful world. But we need to trust in a God who restores. And we need to share those stories about how he has brought restoration. God does restore. He does provide peace. He does provide provisions. 
We need to return to God with our whole heart. We need to focus upon his character, and we need to seek him with prayer and fasting. And perhaps some of you, for the very first time, you need to believe and trust in Jesus, a God who can do all of that. And so one of the things I would encourage us to do too is to reflect on the great things God has done. We saw that mentioned a couple of times in these verses. For he has done great things. Think about all the different stories that you've read in the Bible. The great things that God has done. Reflect on the great things that God has done in your life and in your family. Think of some of those great things. Marriage, the blessing of children, salvation of a child, maybe your job, and you could go on and on. Reflect on the great things that God has done in this church. God continues to bring guests. God continues to add new people, young and old. Uh, we celebrated a few weeks ago uh, paying off uh, our loan. God is working through us to reach people here in this community with the gospel. I celebrate that God has done a great thing by bringing you here this morning. God is continually about doing great things. God restores and he is also a God who provides. The third thing I want you to see, let all creation rejoice in a God who provides. Let all creation rejoice in a God who provides. Look in verses 21 through 23. One of the things you see, Joel starts off, and God is speaking here, and he says, Fear not, O land. This is a command. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord your God has done great things. There it is again. We saw in Joel uh, 1 through 2 that God's judgment on the sin of his people, it affected the land, the trees, the plants, the animals. And here in Joel 2.21, God says, fear not, O land. Isn't that interesting? God speaks to the land. Fear not. Be glad and rejoice, for God has done great things. God also provides... For the animals. Look at in verse 22. We saw in Joel 1 through 2 that God's judgment on the sin of his people, it affected the animals. <clears throat> Joel 2.22 here, God speaks, he says, Fear not, you beast of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green, the tree bears its fruit, the fig tree and the vine give their full yield. <clears throat> God speaks to the animals and says, Fear not. You will be provided for. You know, it's kind of interesting. We, uh, earlier this year, we uh, actually had our first uh, family pet. And, and it's amazing how dependent he is for us to consistently feed and water. And I, I kind of get the idea sometimes if, if his bowl's not food, especially full and especially if you're eating something, man, uh, cowboy is coming close to us. And, of course, actually he kind of does that any time uh, that food is out. I mean, he's like, especially if it's meat. There's something about dogs that they just kind of sniff that out. And they're like, man, they're making a, a beeline. One of the things we need to see is that God takes care of his land. God takes care of the animals. And God also takes care of his people. So, again, we saw in Joel uh, chapters 1 and 2 that there was judgment and consequences because of their sin. But here in Joel 2.23, God says, Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. How cool is that that I'm preaching through this text on rain we haven't had rain forever and it rains the day I, that's just, i just think that's just kind of cool um that god would do that he has poured down for you abundant rain the early and the latter rains as before god commands us 
be glad. We can be glad because God provides. Everybody say, be glad. I, you've got to turn to your neighbor and you've got to, let, you've got to tell them. Somebody who's not smiling, say, turn to them and say, be glad. Be glad. All right. I, I think... When, when we're here at church and we're worshiping God and fellowshipping with one another, uh, there ought to be some, some joy and rejoicing. We ought to be glad. Uh, and he goes on to say, rejoice in the Lord. And again, we can rejoice in the Lord because he provides. And so I want you to turn to somebody and say, rejoice in the Lord your God. <clears throat> now, sometimes we need to be reminded of that, don't we? I mean, there are times where I mean, it, it affects all of us. Sometimes we get down in the dumps and we get discouraged. Sometimes when you look at what's going on in the culture, when you look at what's going on in the stock market, when you look at what may be happening with some of your retirement accounts and that kind of thing, sometimes it can be discouraging. Rejoice in the Lord your God. He always provides. He is faithful to provide. There's a story about uh, a German preacher, August Franke, who founded an orphanage to care for homeless children. And one day, when he desperately was short on funds and needed funds to carry on his work, there was a destitute Christian widow that came to him asking and begging if he could just spare one gold coin so that she could buy some food didn't have any food and his response he's he's caring for these orphans and he says hey because of where we are financially i'm sorry i just can't help you right now and so this widow begins to weep profusely and he's touched by her response and he says tell you what let me go seek the Lord. Let me pray what God would want me to do. By the way, that's always a good decision, all right, to spend some time in prayer deciding what God wants you to do. And so he goes and prays, and after seeking some guidance from God, he really felt that the Holy Spirit wanted him to change his mind and wanted him to, to give this widow a gold coin. And he was going to trust that the God of the universe was going to meet his needs and then he was going to meet the needs of the orphans that were under his care. Two mornings later, he received a letter of thanks for the widow. And she explained that because of his generosity, she had asked the Lord to shower blessings on the orphanage. The same day he received that letter, um, there were, uh, he, he received 12 gold coins from a wealthy lady and two more from a friend in Sweden. And he thought he had been amply rewarded for helping the widow, but he was soon informed that the orphanage was to receive an additional 500 gold coins from a particular estate. When he heard this, he wept in gratitude. In sacrificially providing for that needy widow, he had been provided for, not impoverished. We need to trust in a God who provides. Don't fear. Trust. How does, God, how does God's word speak to your fears? Listen to a few passages of scripture. Isaiah 41.10. Fear not. I am with you. Be not dismayed, dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will hold, help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Matthew 14, 25, you're familiar with this story. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. This is Jesus, he's walking out to his disciples. There's a storm and the disciples are afraid. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it's a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. We need to rejoice 
We need to rejoice in God. Deuteronomy 26, 11 says, And you shall rejoice in all the good that the Lord your God has given to you. 1 Chronicles 16, 10 through 12, Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Psalm 13, 5 through 6, But I have trusted in your steadfast love, my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. Psalm 37, 31, 7, I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love. Psalm 90, 14, satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all of our days. How about this in the New Testament? Romans 5, 10 through 11. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We need to rejoice in the Lord. If you want to rejoice in the Lord and you need a good uh, book of the Bible to read, read Philippians. Paul writing from prison, and it just oozes with joy and rejoicing. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say, though you know, do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Throughout Scripture, we have this command to rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. And we can continue to rejoice because God always keeps his promises. He always keeps his promises. That's the last point. Follow the promise-keeping God. Follow the promise-keeping God. Joel 2.24, Scripture says, The threshing, threshing floors shall be full of grain. The vats shall overflow with wine and oil. These are, these are promises that God is making to his people. And if God makes a promise, he's going to see it through. By the way, you see this, this emphasis on shall be and shall throughout the next several verses. God will restore all the years of destruction from the locusts. Apparently, there had been multiple years where their crops had been ruined by locusts. And he says in verse 25, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent among you. There are times that God takes things away to judge us, to call us to repentance. But he also gives back abundantly even more. God will satisfy you. Look in verse 26. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. One of the ways John Piper says it is God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. God will never let you be put to shame again. Later on in verse 26, and my people shall never again be put to shame, and, my pe and then also in verse 27, and my people shall never again be put to shame. God has the desire that uh, as his people, as he protects us, as he provides for us, as he blesses us, ultimately he gets the glory. And then I love what he says in verse 27. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is no one else. God promises his presence. 
God promises his presence. And as we think about following the promise-keeping God, it's important to be reminded of his promises. In fact, one of the great disciplines is to, to be aware of some key promises that are going to provide you with encouragement and hope when you have those valley days or those valley weeks, <laughs> maybe those valley months, and we all have them. We need to be encouraged by the promise-keeping God. Let, let me share with you just a few of those from Scripture. By the way, you can look these up if you go to gotquestions.org, type in promises, you're going to see some of these and you can read through them. God promised that if we search for him, we will find him. Deuteronomy 4, 29. God's not playing hard to get. Perhaps you don't know God. You don't have a relationship with him. One of the things I would encourage you to pray, God, help me to know you. God, help me to find you and see what God does. God promised protection for his children. Psalm 121, he is the vigilant watchman over all of Israel. God promised his love will never, ever fail. 1 Chronicles 16, 34. God promised blessings for all those who delight themselves in his word. Psalm 1, 1 through 3. A few promises from the New Testament. God promised salvation to all who believe in his son. Amen? Romans 1, 16 through 7. There's no greater blessing than the free gift of salvation. God promised that all things will work but for the good of his children. Romans 8, 28. God promises comfort in our trials. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. Now, I don't like trials. I'm like you. I imagine you don't like trials. You don't welcome them. But one of the things we know, when they come, God is there as our comforter. God promises new life in Christ. 2 Corinthians 517. God promised every spiritual blessing in Christ. Ephesians 1 3. God promised to finish the work he started in us. Philippians 1 6. God's not finished with you yet. We're all still in process. And he's working to move in and through us to make us more like Christ. God promised peace that when we pray his peace will guard our hearts philippians 4 6 through 7 god pr promised to supply your needs philippians 4 19 matthew 6 33 a few promises from jesus in the gospels jesus promised rest matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30 Jesus promised abundant life, John 10.10. 10. Jesus promised eternal life to those who trust him, John 4.14. 4, Jesus promised his disciples power from on high, Acts 1.8. Jesus promised that he's going to return for us. John 14, 2 through 3. There are all kinds of promises and more promises that could be listed. All of them find their ultimate fulfillment in Jesus, the radiance of God's glory, Hebrews 1, 3. No matter how many promises God has made, they are all yes in Christ Jesus, 2 Corinthians 1, 20. So where are you? Do you need to trust in a faithful God? Do you have that kind of trust that God is faithful in your life? Do you believe in a God who restores? Do you worship God? Do you rejoice with all creation that God provides for you? Are you following the promise-keeping God? Let's pray. God, we come to you this morning.
with a desire to know you, the one true God. God, your word says that you are present here with us. Lord, we rejoice in you and your presence here with us. Lord, pray for someone here, maybe somebody watching online, that has yet to turn from their sin and has yet to place their faith in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation. Lord, I pray that your spirit might work in a mighty and powerful way to draw them to yourself and enable them to confess you as Lord and Savior. Lord, for those of us who are believers and perhaps we've struggled with things this past week, this past month, perhaps this past year, Lord, I pray that you would help us to see you anew and afresh ways that you've revealed yourself in Scripture, that you're a faithful God, that you're a God who restores, that you're a God who provides, and you're a promise-keeping God. God, to help us to walk daily in those truths. So the Lord, we might give you glory and honor so that other people might come to know you as they see you will work in and through us in mighty and powerful ways. In your name I pray. Amen. Now, I've got a family that uh, is going to come down front to uh, join this morning. I'm going to ask uh, Steve and Kathy Martin and uh, Jack Eccles uh, to come down front. Uh, we had them over to the house this past week. Had a wonderful time eating and fellowshipping together. And uh, uh, I'm telling you, if you haven't heard their stories, uh, you need to ask them to share the story about some different things that God has done in their life. Um, in fact, it was uh, kind of fun that uh, Steve put a timer on Jack for him sharing his salvation story. Because uh, if, if you were hanging out at the last fellowship meal we did at North Park, uh, I, I love hearing... Jack's stories and let me just say he's been around the block several times he's got a few stories to tell uh, so I got to hear each of their salvation stories and hear about their spiritual journey and their uh, baptism uh, everybody in favor of welcoming them to First Baptist Murphy say amen, amen. alright so I'm going to encourage you to have a seat just for a moment and then uh, I'm going to ask you to come stand back up here uh, after I finish announcements, I want you to come by and welcome them. Or would it be easier maybe to be seated and have them come by and welcome? Yeah, uh, so they're, they're going to remain seated. You come by here and welcome them. Introduce yourself. Many of you know them already. They've been coming for uh, a while. But uh, reintroduce yourself. Let them know that you're glad uh, to have them here and to be a part of our church family. And if you're interested in joining and becoming a part of First Murphy, uh, let's have a conversation. Let's, let's talk about that. Uh, one of the things we like to do is have families over to our house and uh, just hear your story and your spiritual journey. And then uh, our family share some of that as well. So uh, I want to go over a few announcements uh, before we're dismissed. If you have your bulletin, they're in there. Uh, one of the things I want to say, thanks to the Building and Grounds uh, Committee uh, who did some work this past week and those of you who helped on uh, the work day yesterday, kind of getting ready for Fall Fest outside, uh, thank you uh, for your sweat equity that, uh, that you put into uh, the church here. One of the things, uh, in, in light of some impending rain uh, this afternoon, uh, we will not have gospel connections because, I mean, we're walking door to door so let me encourage you in this way. This is what I want to encourage you to use this time from 4 to 5 this afternoon. Uh, I want to encourage you to maybe text, uh, make a phone call, make a social media post about Fall Fest coming up this next Saturday. And so use it as a time to reach out to friends, families, neighbors. Uh, if you want to text 
something like this, then let's see, I think um, you can uh, email me, uh, Ben at FPC Murphy. Here's my phone number. You can text me, 501-993-6378, and I'll text you this graphic, and you can use that to share with people to your heart's content, okay? But uh, let's use this at a time to uh, share and reach out to people about Fall Fest, inviting them. Everybody who shows up at Fall Fest, uh, they're going to get a gospel tract in their goodie bag. Uh, we're going to have a maze where they'll walk through and hear a gospel presentation. And I'm praying that some of you will have opportunities to engage in some faith conversations with guests who will show up uh, for that. We will have home group. It's going to be over at our house, and uh, that's at 525 Camrose Lane. Uh, this is intergenerational, so we have from young to old and everybody else in between. It's a good time of fellowship. Uh, we'll relook at the scripture I preached on this morning and talk about it and talk about how to practically uh, apply that. One of the things that's not in here, but we want to let you know, Women's Book Club uh, will happen this Monday night, uh, 7 o'clock. That'll be in the gathering room. Also, just be aware... I think most of our guys should have gotten a handout uh, about men and boys camp out that's coming up at the end of uh, October. Looking at the weather, should be perfect. Nice and cool, and uh, it's just going to be a great opportunity. So whether you have kids at home or not, whether you have boys or not, uh, if you're a guy, you're welcome to come and join us. If you want to spend the night, great. If you don't have the time for it, maybe you want to drive uh, down for an afternoon or an evening, you're welcome to do that. Also notice family business meeting and fellowship the last Sunday in October. And then Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes are due November 16th. We got some information over here, plus there's some information out here in uh, our foyer here. A lot of great opportunities to be involved and serve. Uh, this coming Saturday, Fall Fest. From 4 to 6, probably the biggest time that we have the greatest number of guests on our campus at any one time during the year. Uh, many of you signed up to help in some different ways. Thank you. Perhaps you haven't. Uh, there are all kinds of opportunities that we still have available. So whether you're doing a booth or not, uh, plan to be here, and maybe you just want to... Uh, you have something for me, Megan? Um, I thought you were flagging me down. Um, so there are plenty of opportunities for you to be involved. A lot of it, it, it doesn't take any preparation. We just need some boots on the ground uh, or tennis shoes on the ground, people to help meet and greet and man some different, or woman some different stations. And so plan on being here. Even if you've never participated in Fall Fest, come along. We'll find something for you to do. Weather's going to be nice. It's not going to be too hot. Uh, so it's going to be a lot of fun to connect with our community. Okay, I think that's it. Does that cover it all? All right. Uh, I'm going to ask you to come by and meet Jack and Steve and Kathy. Greet them. Welcome them to our fellowship. Introduce yourself. Also, on the way out, make sure you connect with somebody maybe you don't know or haven't seen in a while. Let them know you're glad to see them here. Y'all are dismissed.